While scanning the restaurant for the client I was meant to meet, I spotted my ex-wife, Susan, accompanied by a slightly overweight middle-aged man. It was evident he had once been in good shape, but the effects of indulgence and time had altered his physique. Susan sat beside him, radiating contentment. Every aspect of the man hinted at wealth. Standing in the foyer, memories came flooding back to me. Despite three years having passed since our divorce, the emotions felt as raw as if it were yesterday. This is how I found myself here, observing from afar rather than being by her side. Nonetheless, as events unfolded, her desires were fulfilled. My troubles began with a trip to Albany for a client meeting. Opting to stay overnight to avoid a lengthy drive back, my plans were disrupted when, barely an hour into the journey, the client called to report a broken fender, though he was undamaged. Apologizing for the late cancellation, he expressed his regret, to which I assured him it was no inconvenience, suggesting we reschedule. Nevertheless, I felt unprepared for the extra two hours of driving ahead. Promising to do my best, I planned to return home for a surprise romantic dinner with my beloved wife. Ninety minutes later, I finally turned onto my street. The first thing that caught my eye was the presence of three unfamiliar cars parked in the driveway. Knowing my wife often invited her friends over when I was away, I didn't think much of it. I parked on the street and entered the house, assuming everything was normal. However, the sight of four sets of clothes strewn across the living room floor immediately signaled that something was amiss. As I stood there, a gut-wrenching realization hit me. My wife's passionate cry wasn't a call for help. It was a familiar plea for more intense lovemaking. My heart sank as I grasped the truth. My wife was engaged in a carnal encounter with someone else. Despite my reluctance, I knew I had to face the reality awaiting me upstairs. Upon reaching the top of the stairs, I was met with the sound of my wife emitting a primal scream. Stealthily peering around the bedroom doorframe, I beheld three men. While unfamiliar with two of them, the third was unmistakably her boss from work, Jeff Davis. To my shock, they had my wife engaged in carnal acts. My disdain for Jeff deepened as he showered her with praise, acknowledging her assistance with his business clients. It sickened me to realize that this idiot was exploiting my wife for his professional gain. All three of them treated her as a mere object of pleasure, using derogatory language and exerting their dominance over her. Witnessing her behavior so alien to the woman I knew during our ten years of marriage, I couldn't help but agree with Jeff's choice of derogatory label for her. Quietly retreating, I slipped downstairs unnoticed, seeking refuge in my office. Retrieving my digital video camera, I found it still had some battery life. With an old holiday cassette inside and space for recording, I aimed to document my wife's actions for legal purposes rather than creating some illicit spectacle. Setting up the camera at the bedroom door, I captured footage of my wife's face and the others involved, managing to endure only 510 minutes of the ordeal before my emotions overwhelmed me. While some might find such a scene arousing, for me, it brought only sadness and a profound sense of betrayal. Feeling utterly deflated, I sought solace downstairs to collect my thoughts. In my office, I retrieved my weapon from the safe, removing the safety as a precaution. Though not inclined toward violence, I couldn't shake the urge to assert myself if things escalated. Venturing into the living room, I confiscated the car keys and wallets from the discarded pants strewn across the floor, deflating the tires of all vehicles parked outside, including Sue's car. Returning indoors, a sinister grin crossed my face as I concocted a plan, confident it would succeed if Sue took her cell phone. Spotting it on the bedside table during my recording, I readied my camera, positioned myself discreetly behind the stairs, and dialed her number. After several unanswered attempts, she finally picked up, the silence in the house indicating she had warned the others to remain quiet. Sue, breathless, inquired, Hey Bobby, how's Albany? The faint chuckles of the men in the room were audible. You seem winded, are you okay? I pretended concern in my voice. Yes, had to hurry upstairs for my phone call, she replied swiftly, composing herself. My client canceled, so I'll be home shortly. Interested in dinner? I asked calmly, though internally I felt more agitated than ever. Heading home now? She asked anxiously. Sounds good. Just need to get ready, babe. See you, she hurriedly replied before ending the call abruptly, leaving me with a knowing smile aware of what was about to unfold in just a minute. As anticipated, four completely undressed individuals began descending the stairs into the living room. The men swiftly dressed, and Sue also hurriedly tidied herself. As they all rushed out, Sue slipped on shoes and a jacket, glancing outside, hoping they'd depart before she did. 
Had she been less excited, she might have noticed my car parked on the street. The men all started shouting at her simultaneously, prompting Sue to step onto the porch to listen. At that precise moment, I slammed the front door shut and locked it behind her. My wife caught a glimpse of my face as I closed the door, attempting to communicate through the side window with a pleading tone in her voice. The time for discussion was over. The other men returned to my porch, banging on the front door, indicating they wanted their belongings. Realizing their intentions, I dialed emergency, reporting an attempted break-in. The dispatcher informed me a neighbor had already called. Providing my name and address, I awaited police assistance, which arrived promptly just two minutes later. After the police interrogated my wife, I approached the two officers at the scene and informed them that my wife had been maltreatmented by the men present, demanding their arrest. This caused immediate reactions from the men, who began shouting that they were invited, and she consented, denying any maltreatment allegations. Everyone, including myself, turned to Sue, waiting for her response. She avoided eye contact and admitted in a subdued voice filled with shame that she had invited the men into the house, engaged in closeness activity with them, and wasn't maltreatmented. She acted of her own volition. The men seemed relieved to avoid maltreatment charges. Shortly after, two more police cars arrived, and they recorded everyone's names for their report. The senior officer then addressed me, suggesting that since my wife invited these men and they were all over 18 years old, there was little legal recourse. He recommended counseling or similar assistance, delivering the remark with disdainful glare towards my wife. I instructed the police to call a taxi and informed them that Mrs. Thomas would not be allowed back into the house. That evening, one of the men called a taxi after discovering their flat tires. They also attempted to accuse me of stealing their belongings, but I refuted their claims to the police. Turning, I walked back to the porch, where Sue remained with them until the taxi arrived. I stood on the porch, my eyes flashing with anger. Despite my fury, my wife bravely approached me. Unaware of my rage and the firearm on my person, she may have fled had she known. Bobby, I'm deeply sorry, she attempted to speak, but I swiftly interrupted. You've shattered my heart and I'll never forgive you. Jeff called you a strumpet and honestly, I think it's fitting. Henceforth, I'll refer to you as such and won't use your real name again. If you ever need to communicate with me, do so through Tad. With those final words, I retreated into the house, locking the door behind me, leaving her standing there. She hurried back to the group in tears, and Jeff moved to console her. She rebuffed his embrace, which oddly brought me some solace. However, my fleeting satisfaction soon waned. Upon returning to my bedroom, the scent of lovemaking pervaded the air, further incensing me. I erupted in fury, ransacking the entire room. Hauling the mattress, I hurled it onto the front lawn. Retrieving my toolbox from the garage, I disassembled the bed, tossing its pieces outside along with the mattress. Returning to the bedroom, I seized Sue's cell phone from the floor, scrolling through her contacts and messages. Predictably, I discovered repugnant emails, photos, and even videos of unfamiliar men engaging in carnal acts with her. Examining the images, it was evident she was acquainted with them. I chuckled bitterly at my former attentiveness to her, realizing those days were long gone. I carted all the boxes from our bedroom downstairs, depositing their contents in separate piles on the front lawn. Proceeding to purge her belongings from the guest room, I encountered an unexpected revelation. Moving each dresser drawer outside as I had done with the bedroom items, I encountered resistance with the last bottom drawer. Fueled by anger, I forcefully yanked it, hearing a telltale crack. With a bit of force, the drawer finally opened, revealing the source of the obstruction. Seven or eight DVDs hidden beneath. I accidentally cracked one of the plastic cases, but fortunately, the drive remained intact. My heart sank once more as I examined the discs. I didn't think I could feel any worse, yet I did. Descending the stairs, I scrutinized the titles on the discs, which only intensified my distress. Arriving in the living room, I arranged everything on shelves for closer inspection. The first disc depicted Sue with her close friend Sarah at Sarah's residence. Sue often assisted at Sarah's gatherings in Avon, typically held on Tuesdays and Thursdays. It seemed they engaged in closeness activities with various individuals at her house. As I watched the footage over several hours, tears welled up, halting only at the sight of the final two discs. The first showcased Sue with her tennis instructor, a service I funded. She attended lessons every Saturday, returning too fatigued for closeness later in the evening, which now became clear. The second disc revealed Sue engaging in closeness encounters at her workplace, 
specifically in the boardroom with Jeff, her boss, and Jeff's superior, Bill Evans. Bill held considerable influence in the community, often featured in newspaper articles for his philanthropic efforts, which, I now witnessed, extended to my wife's private affairs. Retrieving a large envelope, I carefully placed inside it a cell phone, the discs, and a cassette tape I had recorded earlier. My intention was to hand the entire envelope over to my lawyer and confidant, Ted Worth, my trusted friend of many years. He was one of only two individuals in whom I truly confided. Nothing else mattered at that moment. Glancing at Sue's computer on the desk, I powered it up and began duplicating every file, email, photo, and video onto external drives. It took approximately an hour to complete the process, after which I settled down to sift through my wife's digital archives. Among the videos were scenes reminiscent of those found on the CDs I had discovered. Additionally, I stumbled upon explicit images typically associated with adult websites. Delving further, I uncovered a trove of emails spanning about six months. Despite her attempts to conceal them under misleading file names, I unearthed correspondence between her, Jeff, and several other men, as well as exchanges with Sarah. Just last week, I had dismissed them until one nearly devastated me. The thought of using my weapon crossed my mind, but I realized she wasn't worth it. I had to remain strong. The only email that affected me this deeply was from Sue to Sarah. Sarah questioned why she hadn't left me to be single again and asked Sue to detail her ideal future husband. Here's how she responded. Sarah, I have no interest in him anymore. Bobby is faithful but foolish. I fear he'll soon uncover my secret lifestyle. He's not entirely clueless, but love blinds him. Lately, he's been gaining weight, and his expanding belly is off-putting. Comparing him to other men, he's lacking. I also detest beards and mustaches, which make him appear somewhat repulsive. I once loved him deeply, but the excitement of recent years is too enticing to give up. His lawyer best friend could pose problems if he gets involved. Jeff and Bill at work hint at promotions and perks, with suggestive undertones. I laugh. I also desire a house and a car. If I play my cards right, I could also secure alimony each month. Additionally, I'm anticipating our Tuesday party, pending recovery from my tennis injury. Tony is impressive. Ensure I receive last Thursday's video. It was my first time with so many men simultaneously. As for my dream man, he must be affluent, loyal, compliant, and not too bright. He must cater to my every whim and still ask which one. I chuckle. I'm indifferent about the bedroom as long as there's money involved. I laugh. I can fulfill my needs elsewhere. Sometimes it feels too easy. Damn, Bobby's home now. Gotta go. See you on Tuesday. Call me Sue. I read this letter repeatedly, its words disgusting, and the last few years deeply hurting me. Did she truly feel this way about me? Was my love so blind that she cheated on me for over two years? Afterward, I retired to bed and fell asleep on the sofa. The next morning, plagued by restless sleep, I called in sick to work. I reached out to my close friend and lawyer, Ted Worth. Mary, Ted's secretary, answered the phone. I'd known her almost as long as Ted. I urgently requested a meeting, but she informed me he'd be tied up in court all day. Mary informed Ted that I need to meet him in his office in an hour. If he starts bothering you with nonsense, bring up Tammy Brown's name. That'll grab his attention. See you in an hour, I said before ending the call promptly. I began getting dressed when my phone rang. Reluctant to speak with Sue, I checked the caller ID. It was an unknown number, so I answered, suspecting it might be Ted returning my call. Hello, Mr. Thomas. This is Bill Evans from Susan's office. If possible, I'd like to discuss the events from last evening at your house. Could we meet today in my office to clarify the situation for all involved? Unsure if he was aware of the video footage of him with my wife at his workplace, I knew he was concerned about retaining Jeff Davis's key clients. My wife and Jeff were valuable assets to him, and he likely didn't want to lose them. Additionally, he was surely worried about negative publicity for his company and himself personally. Mr. Evans, I have an important meeting this morning, but I'll call you back on this number before noon to arrange something for today. I assured him calmly. I conveyed it as though he was reasoning with me. He was in for a surprise. As I stepped out, I glimpsed what resembled a bizarre yard sale. The broken bed and Sue's clothes were still strewn about. An elderly neighbor waved, wearing a curious expression. I knew I'd become the talk of the neighborhood. As they say in the news, it was a suburb sensation. In the city center, I grabbed a bite to eat before heading straight to Ted's office. Mary brewed a cup of coffee for me. Lots of cream, no sugar. We had a long history together. Holy crap, Bobby. I don't know what you've got on Tad, but I mentioned his name and he instructed me to clear his schedule for today. I could use a month off, she quipped. 
If you want to know who Tammy Brown is, she added jokingly, you'll have to ask Ted. By the way, where is he? I inquired. He said he'd be here right away. He needed to reschedule his meeting with the judge for today's court hearing, she informed me. Just then he walked in. Holy crap, Bobby. Tammy Brown. You must be in big trouble for mentioning that name to me. Come into the office and let's talk. Mary, don't patch me through to anyone right now, Tad quickly interjected. I grabbed my coffee and he shut the door for privacy. I recounted the events of the previous evening and shared what I had discovered about Sue's new lifestyle. Then, I handed him an envelope with the evidence I had gathered, and finally, he spoke. He listened attentively to my story without interruption. I could see the legal gears turning in his head as he processed the events from the night before. I also informed him about Bill Evans's request for a meeting today. Well, Bobby, as they say, let's prioritize. I've known you for a long time and I understand you're devastated. Is there any chance for reconciliation with Sue? He inquired. Ted, if it were Katie, your wife, and you found those videos and emails, you'd leave her in an instant. I want a divorce, but I also want to inflict some serious damage. I'm not going to quietly accept this betrayal, I confessed. Okay, first, we'll sue Tony and the tennis club. Sarah is off the table as she's just a friend. Sue's workplace, however, is a different story. Secondly, we'll sue the two clients and their companies who were at your house. We'll also go after Jeff Davis, Bill Evans, and their associates. He warned that things might get worse before they get better, Ted cautioned me. But I don't care. Even if I have to resort to physical confrontation, I'm going to make these people pay for what they've done through Sue, I asserted with anger in my voice. All right, Bobby. Recap what Bill Evans wanted, and we'll proceed from there. Ted informed me that we explored several options, and I favored the final one. A direct attack on Sue's workplace seemed most fitting. I had leverage with video evidence of Davis, Evans, and Sue in their boardroom, Ted explained, noting that as Sue's superiors, they influenced her position. It could also result in serious legal repercussions. I liked the sound of it. Ted also hinted that once Bill Evans realized what evidence we had, his stance would change, likely resulting in a settlement offer. If it's less than two million, he can forget it, I remarked firmly. I'll tell you what, Ted, make it 2.5 million. I've seen your legal bills before, I joked. Come over tonight at 7 p.m. Katie will whip up a fantastic dinner for us. You could use a break from home, I insisted. I promptly scheduled an appointment with Bill Evans for 2 p.m. Following this, Mary peeked into the office. Ted, they're calling you online. One, she informed him. Mary, I told you no calls, he snapped, visibly agitated. Sorry, Ted, but this is Susan. She wants to talk to you, and I thought you might want to answer, Mary persisted. Sorry, Mary, it's going to be a long day, and it's just getting started. Does she know Bobby is here? He inquired. Not that I know, Ted, she replied. Tell her I'll talk to her in a minute, he said more calmly as Mary promptly exited to the reception area. Well, I bet she's already discovered that her cell phone, computer, and all her DVDs are missing. I bet she was furious that I dumped all her belongings on the front lawn along with our bed. I informed him. Wow, you really had a busy evening. Let me handle this conversation and please refrain from intervening. As your lawyer, I need to clarify a few things right now, he indicated to me, connecting the call. I started to overhear a one-sided conversation, but I could almost discern what she was saying to Tad without hearing her words. Hi, Susan, this is Ted. Yes, I already spoke to him. Bobby is a stand-up guy and my friend. I thought you, of all people, would have his back instead of betraying him. No excuses, Sue. I'm not in the mood. Yes, I'll represent him. He has strong arguments. You know this won't be pleasant, right? I'll talk to him. But you've shattered a man who was always faithful and deeply loved you. I doubt he cares about your opinion. My advice is to get yourself a good lawyer. You'll need one. Yes, Bill Evans scheduled an appointment for 2 p.m., though I don't think you should attend. Listen to me, Sue. If you even attempt to eavesdrop outside the office door, I'll advise Bobby to leave and things will escalate. It's better to wait and keep yourself composed today. I know he put your belongings out on the lawn, but just as you can invite strangers into your bedroom, he can remove your possessions from the house. Frankly, I'm surprised he didn't resort to violence last night. Yes, he was armed, but for self-defense purposes. Remember he believed you were in danger of assault. It's in the police report. I can't say for certain, but if it were my Katie, I'd likely be in custody right now. I think he acted out of anger given the circumstances. Regarding your computer, cell phone, and any other missing items, you'll need to speak to the co-owner of the house. Perhaps he left them on the lawn along with your clothes, and someone took them. 
I've handled all the escrow paperwork for the house, and you both have equal rights. How you exercise these rights is up to each of you. Ted responded that he would inform him immediately, and advised Sue sternly to remain where she was and let Bobby stay in the house until things were resolved, as it wasn't safe for her to be there with him at the moment. He then told Sue not to push it and expressed his temptation to punch her in the nose. He instructed her to stay with Sarah and promised to be in touch, asking her lawyer to contact him once they've retained one. Tears wouldn't sway Ted now, as he was not only Bobby's legal counsel, but also his friend. He stated that her tears wouldn't move him, and that he could be ruthless when necessary, which seemed to be one of those times. He expressed regret that she would witness a side of him only his enemies see, and warned her that she wouldn't like it. Ted concluded by instructing Sue to keep her distance from Bobby and remain in her office for the time being, as he wanted nothing to do with her. Glancing up at me, Ted asked if I caught most of that conversation, his tone tinged with sadness. I confessed to my friend that I did catch most of it, expressing my wish to confront her face to face and express my true feelings. However, I admitted that I didn't think I could bear the pain of seeing her again, at least not yet. I have a couple of requests for you, Bobby, he said, his demeanor shifting instantly to one of positivity and optimism. First, hand me those tapes. Tad indicated for me to retrieve the videotapes from the envelope, those from the previous night, the ones featuring Tony at the tennis club, and the footage of Sue with Mr. Davis and Mr. Evans in her office. After handing him the tapes, he instructed me to invite Mary to join me for lunch. I gave him a puzzled look, to which he promptly responded in kind. I think it's best if I review them myself to spare you any further distress before our meeting at 2 p.m. Moreover, I don't believe watching this material would benefit you right now. I don't want you to be upset before our meeting with Bill Evans. I acknowledged his wisdom and thanked him before sharing the good news with Mary. She jokingly suggested I take her to an upscale restaurant if Ted was footing the bill. We both chuckled and left the premises. Mary proved to be an excellent dining companion, and for the next hour she helped me forget my troubles. Upon our return we heard Ted cheering as we entered the office. He was in high spirits doing a little victory dance at his desk. These recordings are a game changer, Bobby. I can't believe it, he exclaimed. My expression turned bittersweet and I think he finally grasped why. Oh, Bobby, I'm truly sorry I didn't acknowledge the significance of these videos. I know Sue's actions have deeply hurt you. I was just excited about what I uncovered. He apologized sincerely. Bobby, come over here. I need your eyes on something. Ted beckoned me, and I complied, positioning myself behind him to view his screen. Did you watch the entire video Tony shot at the tennis club with Sue? He inquired. No, I only managed to skim through some of it last night. It was tough to stomach without feeling the urge to lash out or worse, I admitted honestly. Well, brace yourself. Towards the end, just after Tony and Sue finish, they attract a small crowd in the men's locker room. Yes, the tennis club's locker room. I hate to say it, but she let the other men who were watching join in after Tony. I'm not telling you this to upset you, but to shed light on this guy right here, Ted explained, pointing at the screen on his desk. The individual he was indicating was an older man DML treatmented in a towel. With his long gray hair and a walrus-like mustache, he asked if I recognized him. Ted hit play on the video and I saw him discard the towel, revealing a substantial package any man would boast about. The issue was, he went straight to my wife and engaged in coition with her. The next moment, she was surrounded by five more men eagerly awaiting their turn, I recounted. Ted, I have no clue who this guy is, but I presume you do, I responded, trying to maintain composure. Bobby, this is ammunition for our meeting today at the tennis club at 16 Nasi, he informed me, his excitement palpable as he explained his strategy. I grinned when I heard his plan. Besides being my friend, Ted was an exceptional lawyer. I was relieved to have him on my side this time. We departed his office for downtown, armed with a portable DVD player, some printed photographs, and legal envelopes. Upon arrival at Sue's building, we proceeded to Bill Evans's office on the top floor, with Sue's office located one floor below. After waiting in the reception area, we were eventually ushered into Mr. Evans's lavishly furnished office. Just before entering, I sensed someone observing me from the hallway. I glanced in that direction and caught a glimpse of the woman before she vanished around the corner. Guess who? I thought to myself, relieved I wouldn't have to confront her today. We stepped into Bill's office, adorned with opulent furniture and adorned with plaques, awards, and photos of him with various notable figures. The thought crossed my mind. Had he ever brought Sue here? At that moment, my disdain for Mr. Evans intensified more than ever. 
I introduced Ted and took the lead in the conversation. Hello, Mr. Evans. This is my friend Ted Worth, and he'll be joining us for the meeting you scheduled today, I informed Bill as we exchanged handshakes. Mr. Thomas, Bob, I thought this was meant to be a private meeting between you and me, Mr. Evans inquired. Well, I decided to bring Ted along. Anything you have to say to me, you can say to him as well, I stated firmly, without opening it up for discussion. He accepted Ted's presence and directed his remarks solely at me, disregarding Ted. This brought a smile to Ted's face. I anticipated what was coming next but allowed Mr. Evans to speak first before we burst his bubble. Bob, may I call you Bob? Bill asked. Absolutely no issues. In fact, I thought it might be beneficial to have Jeff Davis present at this meeting too. I'm not sure if it's feasible, but it concerns him as well, I informed Mr. Evans. After a brief pause, he pressed the intercom button. Julie, inform Jeff that I require his presence in my office immediately. Tell him to drop everything and come here right away. Understood. Jeff will be here shortly. In the meantime, I want to express my sincere apologies for the trouble caused by Jeff and Sue in your life. I know last night must have been awful, but if we collaborate, we might be able to find a solution beneficial to all parties, Bill expressed optimistically. What exactly do you mean, Mr. Evans? I inquired, waiting for Jeff's arrival. I genuinely care for your wife, Sue, Bill began, but was interrupted by Jeff's entrance. He hesitated momentarily, appearing as though he might turn and leave, but Bill instructed him to take a seat. Reluctantly, Jeff complied, avoiding eye contact with me. Bob, I wanted to convey that I have great affection for Sue. Almost like a daughter, he started to speak when Ted interjected. Are you implying you have a penchant for incest, Mr. Evans? Ted asked, catching him off guard. I chuckled to myself, understanding the intent behind Ted's remark. What? What are you suggesting? Do I have a fondness for incest? What on earth does that mean? He retorted with indignation. Well, allow me to illustrate... As they say, a picture is worth a thousand words, Ted stated, placing the DVD player on Bill's desk. These are screenshots from the video you're about to watch. He handed them to Jeff, not Bill. Jeff's eyes widened, and he passed them slowly to Bill. The images depicted Bill and Jeff both involved with my wife, leaving no room for doubt about their identities or actions. I even suspected Bill recognized his own boardroom table where he and Sue had engaged in their activities. Jeff? Are you seriously telling me that you were foolish enough to record this on video and distribute copies? Bill queried, nearly speechless. It was evident that Jeff was currently unable to provide a response and appeared completely dumbfounded. Well, Mr. Evans, here's how it's going to unfold. Oh, and just to clarify, I'm Bobby's attorney as well as his friend. So let me outline what we expect and how we expect you to address it, Tad informed the shocked audience, thoroughly relishing the moment. Firstly, Sue retains her position without question. Bobby believes she'll require employment, and she seems to fit in quite well with everyone here, he directed this statement to Bill, accompanied by a subtle wink. Secondly, Mr. Davis is no longer part of the equation here. Sue stays, and he exits, Tad declared to Bill, gesturing towards the flabbergasted Jeff. Thirdly, we expect you to present us with a monetary offer that respects our intelligence. We'll entertain your initial proposal and provide a yes or no response within five business days. We anticipate taking legal action within two months, possibly sooner if necessary. Before they could interject, Tad initiated the video playback, swiveling the screen for Bill's viewing. It depicted both men engaging in carnal acts with my wife repetitively in their boardroom. Jeff didn't need to watch, given his involvement in the video recording. Bill simply observed with his mouth agape. I could sense his mind working overtime, contemplating how to salvage his business, reputation, family life, and, most importantly, finances. I knew action would be imminent. Jeff, after these gentlemen depart today, we'll need to have a serious discussion about your future employment here. I'll consult with my legal counsel to negotiate a settlement that satisfies you to some extent. You both comprehend the potential repercussions for our business if this information were to surface prematurely, Bill mused aloud. Don't fret, Mr. Evans. We'll maintain your confidentiality until we receive a serious proposal from you. However, I wouldn't rush to terminate Mr. Davis's employment just yet. He may possess additional copies of the video providing him with leverage. If we fail to act, you and Mr. Davis can address this matter independently. Oh, and just so you're aware, both of you could face legal consequences for engaging in relations with an employee, directly impacting your employment status and prospects, Tad cautioned them. As we both rose to depart, Tad reclaimed the DVD player and the photographs we had brought along. We exited just as Bill and Jeff seemed poised for a private discussion. 
I approached Tad with a query, but he gestured for silence until we were outside. I hadn't noticed my wife lurking around the corner, attempting to eavesdrop on our conversation, but Tad had. The last thing I heard was Mr. Evans barking into Julie's intercom. Get Sue Thomas here immediately, I grinned, anticipating an intriguing encounter. Bill would soon discover that I had discovered his DVD in our home. Once outside, I inquired why he had given Jeff an escape route by suggesting he use his own videotape against Bill. Divide and conquer as they say, Ted explained. It's better if they don't act as a united front, but rather each for themselves. That way, if Bill makes a half-hearted offer to us, we can play them against each other. Tad also noted wisely that Jeff and Bill have families and attend church, despite their behavior depicted in the videotapes. They're not keen on rocking the familial boat at present. As I departed the building, I realized it would now be remembered as the site where my wife betrayed me, rather than the esteemed workplace she once inhabited. It saddened me to think about. Ted's words snapped me back to reality. All right, let's grab a beer before our next rendezvous at the tennis club at 4 p.m. We could both use a drink right now, and there's something I need to discuss with you, though I'm not quite sure how yet, Ted mentioned as we drove across town toward the tennis club. We stopped at a quaint bar restaurant adjacent to the tennis club. Ted ordered two beers and began speaking to me. Bobby, I believe Bill Evans will extend an offer, but likely for just under a million. I'm familiar with his legal team from another case, and they're quite adept. He's also a realist. I'll call him tomorrow and convey that a lowball offer won't bode well for his client's business or personal life. I'll propose around three million or suggest we abandon negotiations altogether, he disclosed. Furthermore, I need to ascertain if, in the event the offer is rejected, I have your authorization to cast Susan in an unfavorable light. I won't hold back for anything. My duty as your legal representative is to pursue what ensures victory in court, even if it entails painting an unflattering portrait of her. It might get ugly and highly publicized. I'll utilize every legal means at my disposal to secure our case. You might not appreciate all the potentially damning revelations about Sue, your marriage, and even your carnal life that could surface. I'm not sure if you've considered this aspect, Ted added at the eleventh hour. I expressed that I had given serious consideration to the matter and believed I possessed more integrity than they gave me credit for. I mentioned that if necessary, I was willing to proceed, but I preferred to explore the financial offer route first, which I hinted at to Ted. Ted agreed and suggested starting by evaluating what Bill had to offer. He assured me that if Bill's offer was unsatisfactory, he would handle all the necessary paperwork promptly. Additionally, he mentioned leveraging his newspaper contacts and friends at three local news stations. He said they would be willing to obtain footage or images, even if they needed to censor the explicit content with blue bars, as they say in sitcoms. Ted, you've consistently been there for me and I trust your judgment. I just wish this whole mess never happened. Being an oblivious husband was more enjoyable than being publicly humiliated by a cheating wife. Nevertheless, you have my authorization to take whatever actions are necessary. After all, I didn't initiate this debacle, but I'm determined to conclude it soon, I expressed with frustration in my voice. Understood, Bobby. No problem. Now, let's discuss the material for our next meeting. This guy, Mr. Harry Rydell, is the owner of the Ace Tennis Club. This is the guy I pointed out in the video in my office. He's indicated that he'll likely adopt a laissez-faire attitude, asserting that adults will be adults and he won't intervene. Even Tony's tennis coach might be dismissed for appearance's sake, only to be rehired later. Tony's quite popular at the club, particularly among female members. Keep in mind, Bobby, that while men primarily pay club dues, women are also stakeholders. This dynamic will be pivotal in your interaction with Mr. Rydell, he briefed me on the situation. We arrived just in time, and it was evident that Mr. Rydell and Thad didn't see eye to eye. Their animosity was palpable from the outset, Mr. Rydell told Thad bluntly, signaling the meeting's conclusion. Mr. Rydell, this is Bob Thomas, he said, nodding in my direction, and his wife is a member of your club. It has come to our attention that Tony Simba, your tennis instructor, was having an affair with Mr. Thomas's wife. We want to know what you plan to do about this, Tad finished. He waited for Riddell to speak, but even I knew that he would take everything upon himself, and in a few words, send Thad to hell. Listen, what two consenting adults do behind closed doors in their own time is none of my business, Harry Rydell informed us. And as for you, Mr. Thomas, if you can't satisfy your wife in the bedroom, don't come crying to me and blaming me if she strays. There are plenty of unhappy spouses who frequent the Ace Tennis Club, 
Some keep returning for the personalized attention my staff provides them, if you catch my drift, Harry said, winking at me. I felt the urge to lash out at him, but Ted restrained my wrist and quietly advised me to stay composed and follow his lead. You see, Harry, you're assuming this occurred outside the club without the owner's knowledge and consent. It's presumptuous of you to make such assumptions, Ted confronted him, pulling out a DVD player and placing it on his desk. Ted pressed play, directing the screen towards Harry. It was evident from his reaction that he didn't like what he saw in the video footage. Before Harry could respond, Thad interjected, Harry, you, with full awareness and with your colleague's complicity, took advantage of a paying member of your club. Mrs. Susan Thomas, a married woman whose dues were paid by Mr. Thomas, is now a dissatisfied customer, Thad informed the silent Mr. Rydell. When this information surfaces, every dues-paying man will want to know if his wife is engaging in similar activities while he foots the bill. I'll have to subpoena everyone present in the locker room that day. Married men may not be pleased with you about this, Ted added, adopting an almost storytelling tone. Furthermore, there's the issue of reasonable expectation of privacy when filming in the locker room. Harry, once I'm through with you, your club won't retain its community reputation, and your bank account may suffer as well. Ted asserted for added persuasion. So here's what we're after. A substantial offer from you and prompt action. Doing so could spare you considerable inconvenience and financial loss, Ted concluded, as we observed Harry Rydell weighing his options. Ted, you're still a real piece of work, but I can't argue with your reasoning. I'll contact you tomorrow with my offer. If I comply, all tapes will be returned to me and remain confidential. I'll also willingly terminate Tony's employment. Now if that's all you legal extortionists came for, get the hell out. Harry Rydell dismissed us, as Ted retrieved the DVD player with a grin and powered it off. Oh, and say hi to Tito Martinez, Ted remarked to Harry before exiting the room. Go to hell, Worth, was all Harry could retort. Ted chuckled all the way back to the parking lot. That was quite the adventure. Now we wait for suggestions, Tad informed me as we headed to his house for a delightful homemade dinner. By week's end, Bill Evans had offered nearly $2.7 million to retain Sue as his employee. Jeff Davis, after naively handing over all his tapes to Bill Evans, found himself out of a job. Bill simply terminated him, leaving poor Jeff with little recourse. I went after the two fools who were with my wife the night I caught her with Jeff. They happened to be two of Jeff's major clients. Neither of them wanted any publicity, whether for their companies or themselves. So each of them offered me a million dollars to keep quiet. Harry Rydell refused to make any offer and suggested we take legal action. So we did, and he ended up losing $3 million by the time we were done with him. His club suffered a mass exodus of members, and he was compelled to relinquish ownership. He likely thought he could evade consequences. But the judge wasn't impressed with the footage from the private locker rooms, nor with the infidelity. I granted Sue a house and a car as she desired, without having to pay a cent in child support. I only encountered her twice in court. Both times I greeted her as a strumpet, which brought her to tears. I often pondered why she cried now, but not before causing such turmoil in my life. I came into more money than I ever imagined thanks to following Ted's advice. The pain still lingered, haunting me to this day. All the trials of that dreadful year rushed back in an instant. I hadn't realized anyone was addressing me until I snapped out of my flashback and heard the restaurant manager inquiring if everything was all right. Unsure how long I had stood there lost in thought, I shook my head to clear it and returned to the present. Apologies, just reminiscing about an old issue once I saw the group I came to meet. Thanks again, I explained to the manager, noticing the curious glance he gave, reminiscent of how people regard an elderly person lost in reverie. I made a beeline for my ex-wife's table. The surprise was evident on her face. When last we were together, I was overweight, with long hair and a beard, nursing an old knee injury from baseball. That was my excuse then, but, truthfully, I had settled into a complacent life with her. Now, I sported a shorter haircut, was trim from regular workouts, and had my knee repaired thanks to the money from Jeff and Bill's company. My suits were now upscale, and I made an effort to present well in public. I opted to speak up first. You look fantastic today, strumpet. Almost forgot how stunning you could be, I remarked, intentionally provoking a reaction. I knew exactly how to push her buttons. My name is Susan, Bobby. Why can't you address me by my name? She retorted, clearly irritated. I didn't label you, Strumpet. You know who did? I simply find it fitting. I warned you three years ago that you shattered my heart, and I'll always remember you by that title, I explained, as the man beside her began to object and rise from his seat. 
but Sue urged him to remain calm. Tears welled up, smudging her makeup. Her boyfriend interjected, Go freshen up, Sue, and fix your face. I'll handle this idiot for you. With those words, she stood, locking eyes with me as I reciprocated with a single glance, perhaps revealing the agony I'd harbored for three years. Her tears flowed harder, surprising me that she still harbored any sentiment toward me. Or perhaps it was lingering guilt, likely a blend of both. I expect you to be gone when I return, she declared tearfully, heading to the restroom, where I noticed the sizable engagement ring on her finger as she wiped her eyes and left. You must be Bob Thomas, Sue's ex-husband, he queried with disdain in his tone. Indeed, and you must be the new man she's been dreaming of, I retorted, sensing his indignation. I'm Sue's CFO, and if I were you, I'd refrain from using that term, he cautioned, though his reluctance to cause a scene was evident. I only sought to converse with you privately. I have three inquiries, then I'll vanish from your life forever, I informed him, noting his quizzical expression. I've been in your shoes before, and I don't want anyone else to endure my fate. I suppose the strumpet painted me as a lousy husband, abusive or neglectful, or a womanizer, I remarked, knowing precisely what she'd conveyed to him. But I'm not here to salvage my reputation in your eyes. Honestly, I doubt it'd serve any purpose. First off, does Sarah still host her Avon gatherings at her place on Tuesdays and Thursdays? I inquired. Sue assists Sarah with her decor sales on Mondays and Wednesdays. It seems your memory's a bit faulty, he snapped back. All right then. Does she still take tennis lessons on Saturdays? I pressed. Sue swings a racket on Sundays. You seem to have a hazy recollection for someone married to her for so long, he remarked triumphantly. All right, final question. Have you ever checked under the bottom drawer of the dresser in your living room? I asked hurriedly. No, why would I even do that? He protested. The three questions I pose to you are the reasons why we're no longer together. I still have all the leftover divorce paperwork in my office. Legal documents, emails from Sarah and the other woman, and hours of videotapes. I've carried these with me for the past three years, so I thought you should have them, I explained, retrieving a worn and folded piece of paper from my wallet. This is what the other woman wrote to Sarah when she inquired about how to get rid of me before I discovered her infidelity. After reading that letter, I realized I didn't know her at all and probably still don't. But it all revolves around you, I stated, handing him the paper. However, I knew Sue very well and understood her compulsive habits. She always followed the same routine meticulously, sometimes driving me crazy. I also had a feeling that even with a new man, she'd stick to her old ways, I elaborated. He seemed hesitant to accept the paper, but curiosity seemed to win out. He reached over and opened the email. I've carried it for three years, occasionally rereading it and striving to better myself so that no woman would ever write such things about me again. Of all the evidence, that email hit me the hardest, which is why I've kept it with me. It's the same email I mentioned earlier in my story. Peter read the letter slowly and set it down on the table. Quickly, he grabbed a pen, scribbled a note on it, and to my surprise, abruptly left the restaurant. No glance back, no thanks, nothing. His expression remained impassive. I leaned over to see what he had written on the old email. I'll return home shortly. Please wait here and I'll call you in 15 minutes. I need to check under the bottom drawer of my living room dresser. Be right back, Peter. I sensed he'd seen the truth, even if he wasn't thrilled about it. Something told me I hit too close to home on all three matters. The email seemed to be the tipping point, and he needed to verify it himself. Leaving a note on Sue's table, I departed. There was no way I'd stay in that restaurant with anyone tonight. Back in the foyer, I phoned my client, who didn't mind rescheduling the meeting since they were running late anyway. Before leaving, I glanced once more at the table. Sue returned, searching for Peter. Sitting down, she noticed her old email and Peter's note below. Her face drained of color as she recognized the contents of her old email and Peter's message. The last time I saw my wife, she was sobbing so intensely that the entire restaurant turned to look. I felt a pang of pity, but at the same time I was indifferent. That was the final encounter with her. I still wonder if Peter found something under the dresser drawer. Sue's tears indicated he might have. 